Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to uh, Wednesday of J Focus. It's time to kick this day off, and our first speaker of the day is uh, Marcus Helberg from Vadin. Give him a warm hand. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I am impressed and happy to see so many of you here this morning early. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. So yeah, uh, I am Marcus. I am a curious person by nature. So last fall, feels like a long time ago, I was playing around with GPT-4 and, or sorry, GPT-3 and, and uh, ChatGPT came out a couple of months later and it was like, hmm, this is really interesting. I really want to understand what I can do with this and think around with it. So this is gonna be really a developer to developer talk. I'm not an AI engineer. I'm not going to talk about math. We're just going to take a look at these tools and how we as engineers can use them to build cool stuff. Turns out I'm also a very optimistic person. When I submitted this talk, the only thing on the Spring AI repo was a text saying TBD. Well, <laughs> fortunately, it's there, at least partially, so we'll get to it. And some of these uh, libraries are still very much in progress, but we'll see where they are today, kind of look a little bit at what they are trying to accomplish. And uh, yeah, I think it'll be a fun little journey for us. So AI can be really amazing as a tool. This right here is my dog, Nova. Nova is 11 years old, and as an old lady, she has some aches and pains, as we all do. So a few months ago, we had to go and take her in for a CT scan for her spine, and that was a little bit scary. So in, our, in his infinite wisdom, our radiologist decided the best way of delivering the report was to print it out, put it on his desk, take a picture with his cell phone camera, and text it to us with no explanation. So we're looking at this like dense, packed A4 of medical jargon, trying to understand what's going on. Was it good? Was it bad? So as a nerd, I took this picture, I fed it to ChatGPT, told it to be a radiologist who happens to be exceptionally good at communicating with human beings, and asked it to summarize the main points in an easy to understand way. And sure enough, I got a couple of bullet points explaining what's going on, what's good, what's bad. It turns out there wasn't anything really to worry about, and it was really just a relief. He did call later and explain the same thing, but there was a good couple of hours of just unnecessary worry we were able to kind of not have to go through thanks to this. But if you've ever used an AI tool like an LLM, you also sometimes think like, how are they so stupid sometimes? Like you ask them something that's seemingly pretty straightforward, simple, and you get a really dumb answer. So what's up with that? On a conceptual level, an LLM is a fairly straightforward thing. You ask it a question, magic and unicorns and math happen, and then answer plops out. So that, that's pretty good. The problem really comes in is that LLMs by nature are very generic, whereas what you and me are doing in our jobs is very specific to what we're trying to accomplish or what our customers are trying to accomplish. So there's this disconnect between the nature of a large language model being generic and what we're trying to accomplish. Now, I work at a company called Vaadin, and what we do is we try to help Java developers build web apps. We specifically focus on business apps, and these are the kind of not super sexy apps that just run the world. They're in the back office of your company. They run all the big processes and make the business go around. And these apps have just a tremendous amount of really tedious boilerplate, mind-numbing tasks that I think AI would be really well positioned to help. We could use AI to really make these people's lives better when they're using this piece of software for eight hours a day. So this led me on a journey to really try to understand how can we use AI as tools to not only make our own lives as developers easier, but also make the lives of our end users, the users of the applications that we build, make that better. So one way of looking at LLMs and this whole landscape that I feel is very helpful to me as an engineer is looking at it as a kind of a uh, computer architecture diagram. So this is by Andre Karpathy, and he shared this on Twitter, I think, a couple of months ago, but it really stuck with me. So we can see the LLM 
sort of being a CPU in an architecture. It knows how to do things, but it's, it's pretty generic, so a CPU alone won't get you very far. At a very minimum, you need some working memory or a context window in an LLM's case in order to do something meaningful. Most likely, you'll want some longer term storage, so this is where something called a vector store comes in, where we can store some stuff for later retrieval so that we can refer back to stuff that we're not able to fit into that uh, memory. Of course, a CPU without programs is fairly limited. You can do some stuff, but you're a little bit limited. And kind of going for further, we might even want to connect to other LLMs because some of these are trained on different things and they're good at different things. So we might actually want to do kind of hook up a whole bunch of different things and build something more meaningful. And this is really where these AI libraries come in. Today, we're going to look at three libraries specifically, Langchain4j, I know uh, Lisa did already a keynote and another talk yesterday on Langchain, but hopefully I'll be able to kind of add a little bit more to that discussion. We're also going to look at a newcomer, Spring AI. I couldn't find a logo for them, so I just put AI after Spring. I hope they don't mind. <laughs> and then we're going to take a look at Microsoft's entry into this uh, field, which is Semantic Kernel. Uh, Langchain for J especially is a a Java version of a Python library called Langchain that's been around for a while, whereas Spring AI and Semantic Kernel are kind of their own things. Semantic Kernel it, uh, initially started out as a C-sharp project that now also has a Java version in, in the making. Like I said, this is going to be a very much AI for engineers talk. We're going to talk about the APIs, not the math kind of behind the APIs. Since we're in Sweden, it's essentially like we're interested in, we're, we're not interested in knowing how the meatballs are made as long as they're tasty. Yeah, thanks. That was excellent. Anyway, the way I want to structure this talk is along an axis of agent autonomy. I initially, when I did this talk last week in a user group, I had this whole own meme thing that I built up, but then I ran into this. Uh, figure on the Microsoft side, and I was like, that is exactly what I was trying to do, but it seems a lot more professional, so let's go with that. So if we're looking at an AI as an agent that can do things for us, there's kind of a, um, kind of an increasing uh, line of autonomy where at the lowest level, when we're interacting with an LLM, it's essentially a chatbot. We can have a chat, but it's not really aware of much more than what we've just given it within that chat history. If we take one step further, we have retrieval augmented generation, or RAG, which means that we can chat with an LLM, but also it knows something about our specific context that we're in. We're able to give it some documents, like when we're, or when you're answering, like use this material as your help to answer me with some, something that's really useful. If we take one step further, we're at a co-pilot level, and this is kind of, we're still sitting in the pilot's chair, but we have a co-pilot who is able to do some tasks for us. We only give it kind of a cer certain amount of tools and allow it to do a few things for us, but it can do some things for us so we don't have to do all of the things. And then at the other end of the spectrum is essentially a fully autonomous system where we just tell it to go do something and hope for the best. All right, so let's start at the very beginning. So what's the kind of really basic way of interacting with an LLM from Java? So this is essentially if we go back to our diagram from earlier, we're just looking at the LLM itself and its context window. Now, what we want to have from uh, a library at this level is a way of dealing with different LLMs. I feel like there's a new one coming out at least every day, if not more often and I don't want to build my, kind of rebuild my app that often. So I want to be able to kind of mix and match different LLMs. They might be uh, trained on different data sets. They might be good at different things. And it's really handy if I have one interface that I can build against, and then I can swap out the actual implementation based on what I'm trying to accomplish. Another thing that's really tedious if you've ever tried to do this on your own is managing this memory or context window on your own. So if you remember the, the diagram, we had our CPU, the LLM, and the memory or the context window separate. So the LLM itself does not retain any memory of our interactions with it. We always need to pass it anything we want it to know while we're talking 
with it. This amount of memory that we have is around four to 100 plus uh, thousand tokens. Tokens being these subwords that the LLM uses to split the text into. So if we have 4,000 tokens, that might be around 3,000 words or so in English or Swedish. Into that, we need to fit quite a lot of things. So we need to have a system prompt. In my case, this was me telling ChatGPT to be a radiologist that is capable of communicating with human beings. We need to have the history of our chat with this bot in there so that it knows what we've said earlier. We need to have whatever our current question is. We might want to include some relevant information in there so that it can answer us in a more helpful manner. And what's also important is to leave enough space in that memory that it can actually generate an answer there. So if we fill up the entire thing, there's no room anymore for, for an answer. So we need to be really mindful of what we put in there. And especially things like dealing with the history becomes a little bit tedious. So if you have a long discussion, what do you do with it when you're kind of running out of memory? Do you start dropping messages from the top? Do you start summarizing the history? Whatever you want to do, that's a lot of like uh, token counting and a lot of just low level math that distracts you from the actual business task at hand. This is what I had to do when I built my first RAG system, which is like a document chatbot for our VOD documentation. And I spent just hundreds and hundreds of lines of code doing essentially like low level uh, token coding that didn't help me at all uh, get anywhere besides like uh, off by one errors in, in every possible direction. So having uh, a library that can take care of that for us so we can focus on what's in interesting is, is really helpful. We also want to have a way of templatizing our prompts, our prompts being what we send over to it. Uh, very similar to how we have template languages for like HTML or other markup, where we just want to inject some properties into a given template. We want to do the same for uh, communicating with an LLM. This can be especially useful when we chain multiple calls together. When the output of one LLM call goes straight into the other one, we can give it a template that it should follow. And finally, we want to have some way of kind of forcing the LLM to give us a answer in a specific format. So that might be JSON, it might be a Java object since we're Java developers, it might be XML, it might be something else. But it's super handy if we can actually expect to get a Java object back because that's much easier to deal with in, in Java than just a random string. All right, so that's a lot of talking with a lot, not a whole lot of code. So let's take a look at how we actually do this in code. We'll start with Langchain. And what I want to do here is read into a Java record translation uh, three values. So I want to have the original text, I want to have the target language, and what the translated text is. The way this works in Langchain for J is that we define an interface uh, that defines how we want to interact with an LLM. So we say that we have an assistant interface. We expect to have a translation returned from our method. Uh, that's called translate, and we're going to take in two parameters, the original text and the language. We're able to pass in a template here with the user message annotation and this uh, V annotation in front, of the, uh, in front of the parameters is what helps map those values into the template. So once we have that, we can use a AI service builder to get an instance of this interface. So similar to how like Spring Data might give you a, or uh, an instance of a repository, for instance, we use the same kind of idea here where Langchain actually provides the implementation of that interface based on how we configure it. So here I configure it to have a chat language model, which in this case is the open AI chat model. And I have my API key here. This could be any other uh, LLM that they support. So there are tens of different LLMs they support that I could plug in here instead. Also, I have this uh, chat memory here. So this is me telling that, hey, retain the 10 latest messages. If we go over that, just start dropping all their messages as we go. And then all I need to do to get that object or that record is calling the method on my interface. So assistant that translate, passing the original text and the language that I wanted to get into. And that gets us Sprock chat, yeah. Good, that's very helpful. All right. To take a look at the same example in Spring AI, 
starts out very similar. So we have a translation record again. What's different here is that we actually get the chat client completely configured by Spring for us. So we define in our application properties our OpenAI key, and all we need to do in our class is just inject the chat client, and it's going to be ready for us to use. What you will notice, though, is that this is still a much more lower-level lower API. So in order for us to get that object back, we need to first define an output parser, which is a bean output parser here. And we need to define our prompt with three placeholders. So we want to have the text, language, and a format. We then need to instantiate this template by passing in a, let me see here if I can. So pass in a map here with key value pairs. So the text should be Spring AI, language Swedish, and the format should be a format that the output parser gives us. And this is essentially a G JSON uh, schema. We then get a JSON result by calling the client with the prompt that we have. We get the results output content. So this is more or less exactly modeling the open AI low level REST API. And from that content, which is JSON, we can then use the output parser to get this record that we wanted. So still doing pretty much the same thing, but on slightly lower uh, level of abstraction. So here we can now see that Spring AI is Voren AI. Good. Now, when I started building this uh, presentation, I quickly noticed that something odd had happened over at Semantic Kernel. They have the highest version number of any of these libraries, but it's not available on Maven Central or anywhere else. And I contacted the, the lead there, asked what's going on. And apparently, they're doing a slightly bigger API change in the project. So it's a kind of work in progress in a specific branch. So instead of me trying to build their whole uh, world on my local machine, I'm just going to show you uh, from GitHub. So this is if you go to the Microsoft Semantic Kernel repo, you'll find this in the Java v1 branch. And Semantic Kernel is going to look a whole lot different from these two libraries that we've looked at so far. So Semantic Kernel is going to resemble a lot more this like diagram that we started out with. So they're trying to model more of a Unix kernel where you can plug in different programs and the kernel then tries to like run different programs and plugins for you. So again, what we do is we define a, a service that we want to use. They're using ChatGPT3 uh, Turbo. And what's really different here, though, is that they have this uh, kernel function uh, idea here. So let me see if I can get that up here. So they define essentially plugins in YAML files that look something like this. So you define a template using handlebars in this case, and you define what the input and output variables to this function should be. You can even define how this program should run on different models. So they have different variables or kind of uh, settings for GPT-3 and GPT-4, for instance. So this is a little bit more kind of setup that you need to do before you get started. But once you have that started, you are able to set up a kernel using that, that uh, service. You can register this first function there, and then you can invoke it by passing in the function and your arguments, and that's going to get you the result. So not perhaps as easy to get started, but I could see how, like, as your app grows bigger and you need to share functions between different applications, this might be a more handy way of going about it. Good. All right, so let's take a look at retrieval augmented generation. I think we've heard that kind of word rag thrown around here uh, quite a lot, even during the last day. And I want to kind of try to explain what that means in kind of more theoretical terms first before we go into the code. So this is essentially us adding a permanent storage to our diagram here. And in order to understand what we're trying to go for here, it's good to understand what LLMs know from before. So essentially, they know two things. They know whatever material they're trained on, which tends to be more or less the entire internet up to some specific point in time. And the other thing they know is whatever we pass them in that context window. So there are a couple ways that we could go about 
training and LLM, teaching it new things. One is great if you're a billionaire and have very specific needs, is training your own model from scratch. Uh, we're not going to do that here. The other is to fine tune a model. So you take an existing LLM and you keep training it with something that's very specific to your business. That's not terribly expensive or difficult even, but there's an even easier way that we're going to look at here. And that's essentially just figuring out what's relevant for answering this specific question and including that in the context window so that when the LLM answers, it basically has an open textbook exam where it knows where to find all the answers for that question. Now that gets us to the problem of how do we know what to include in that uh, context window. We're getting charged by the amount of tokens we use, so we don't want to put too many things in there. Also, as Lee said yesterday, if we put the wrong things in there, like something that's not relevant, that might throw the LLM off and it might start answering based on that information instead of being helpful. So we really need to understand what is the relevant piece of information to include there. So in this case, uh, I'm I have a document that's a terms of service document, and I want to make this available to my LLM. The first step of doing that is splitting it into meaningful sections. So we want to kind of figure out what's, what's a meaningful section in our, in our document, and then turn those sections into a numeric representation as a vector. So essentially, we take the meaning of a piece of text and turn it into a vector. I remember seeing this the first time and it was very hard to understand like what exactly is going on. Like how do we take a piece of text that can be in any language, it doesn't even need to be in the same language, and somehow we get a vector representation of that. It's like, what, what kind of sorcery is that? So the way I like to explain this to anyone who is entirely new to this concept is by using a color picker as an example. So if you've ever used one, you'll know that you can pick essentially any color on the spectrum and get back a three value vector of RGB, red, green, blue. Intuitively, we can kind of understand that colors that are very similar will have very similar RGB values, and colors that are very far from each other will have very different RGB values. And that's why it's really important for us to kind of split these uh, documents into meaningful sections, because otherwise we're essentially asking what's the meaning of this entire photograph? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, sure, you could probably get some mean value of all the colors in it, but it doesn't really help us that much. If we can be more specific, like what's the color of my watch armband, then that's a much more meaningful question to answer. So by splitting our document into meaningful sections, we get much more uh, relevant embeddings. The actual math that goes into kind of calculating the meaning into embedding is something that an API does for us. It's not something we need to do. It's just helpful to understand kind of on a high level how that works so that we can do it in a proper way. Once we have these, we want to put the text itself and its vector representation into a vector store. And yes, I did draw this myself. As I told you, I'm an engineer, not a designer. So once we have those in our vector store, we are able to start querying that. So if somebody now came into our system and asked, hey, what's the cancellation policy? we could take that text, what's the cancellation policy, run it through the same API to get a vector representation of its meaning. Then we could query the vector database for documents that are similar in meaning. So in this case, it's like, hmm, this has something to do with cancellation. So in our case, the relevant piece of document is number three, canceling bookings. So that's probably what we need to include in our, in our uh, context window as we're asking the LMR question. So let's take a look at what this looks like in code. So we're starting again with uh, Langchain. And what we're doing here is I have a path to a document, which is this text file that I have. And I'm going to use a built-in loader that they have, saying that, hey, I want to load this document using this text document parser. I define a splitter. So this is what takes that document and splits it into into chunks. And here I chose that I want 400 character chunks with no overlap. The recursive splitter means that it tries to first split by paragraphs. That if they are too big, then it'll start splitting by sentences and try to kind of get into that. So as you're 
doing this, you probably want to play around with how big these chunks needs to be in, in your particular use case. For instance, if you're dealing with, say, markdown or something structured where you have headings, probably a good section is whatever is under a given heading, so you can kind of split by that. That's, that was really helpful for me as a, uh, when I was doing embeddings for our documentation, for instance. I'm using an embedding model that's just in JVM, so we don't need to call an API. So this gives us those vectors based on a text that we pass in, this uh, embedding model here. Also using an in-memory vector store. Uh, all of these are, AP, are interfaces that we can uh, uh, change. So if we wanted to use OpenAI for generating embeddings, we could do that. If we wanted to use another vector store, Pinecone, Redis, uh, anything else, we could just plug that in instead. Based on those, we create an ingester and pass in our document. So that's going to ingest that into the vector store. This is something that you do once whenever the document changes, so this should not be in your actual application or happen on every time you ask a question. This is something that just happens whenever your document changes. Then, in order to actually query this, we need to build a retriever a retriever takes in the same embedding model and store that we had before. So it has the database. It knows how to take a text and turn it into a vector. We say that we want at most two results. They should be vaguely relevant. And then we do the same thing that we did before. So we use the builder to create a support agent. And the only thing that's different here is that we've registered this retriever. So that tells Langchain that before answering, or like before sending this over to the LLM, go and retrieve uh, relevant documents to include in that query. So that's kind of where this chain comes in, Lang chain. So it chains together different calls, in this case, kind of behind the scenes for us. So if I ask now, what is the cancellation policy? I'm going to get a fairly relevant answer explaining what the cancellation policy is based on that document that I have. Now, when I did this talk uh, last week, the maintainer of langchain for j wanted me to also let you guys know that there is a new advanced drag feature in langchain where you could actually ask the the vector store to return a lot more documents and then the, you can use a re-rank uh, feature to have another llm actually figure out if they're relevant or not so uh, that's something that's worth checking out on the langchain page if that is something that you are interested in doing good all right, so let's take a look at Spring AI. So again, we're going to create a vector store. This is our uh, database. And we're going to read in that same Java resource using a text reader. So the API looks a little bit different, but the idea is the same. We tell the vector store to accept the contents of this, uh, contents of this text. I believe the text reader can be configured how to split up the document, uh, but that's kind of outside the scope here. Then I define a template. So again, we're working with a slightly lower level API. So I'm saying, like, answer the question given only the information provided in the terms. If you don't know the answer, please respond with, I don't know. So we're trying to reduce hallucinations, like keeping it to only the information that we give it. Don't try to make up stuff if you don't know. OK, so then we have the query. So this is what we get from the user. What is the cancellation policy? We first use that to figure out what are the relevant documents that we want to include. So we do a similarity search on the vector store with the query. Again, we have the same values here. So two documents, some threshold for how relevant they need to be. That returns both the document and the vector, as you remember. So we're just going to map over that and only get the text content from there and join it with new lines so that we can inject that into the template. Then we need to create our message history. Again, we're on a lower, lower level of API here. So we create an instance of the template that we had on the previous slide and pass in those documents there. Then we create a user message using the query up here. And then we create a prompt that includes that entire history. So with that, we can then call our client with the entire history. And we get a result that again explains our cancellation policy using that document that we had. Good. So let's take a look at what semantic kernel does in a situation like this. So again, we're in the same repo here. 
but we're going to take a look at the third example here called simple rag. Now, their rag example is slightly different because they're not using a vector store here, but they're instead using Bing search as their kind of way of getting relevant documents, but the basic same idea works here again. So we have a kernel function here. Well, that is not what I wanted to do. So we have a kernel function that's again in a YAML file here. And that's under the resources here. And let's see where we can find the, yeah. So what this does is it defines the persona of the, of the, of the agent. So in this case, it should be a helpful assistant. And then it has a template that includes the system message. It has kind of a for each for all the messages in the history. And then it re uh, registers any, any plugins here. And the plugins that it's registering here in this case is a Bing search plugin. So that when you create the kernel here with your chat GPT service and your search plugin, it can then take the question, first plug it into a Bing search, get whatever comes back from there, plug it into the uh, template that actually goes to the LLM. And then in this case, it's answering the question based on whatever the internet provides us with, which we all know is always true. All right, so, so far we've kind of gone two levels deep into our AI autonomy uh, thing, and now we're gonna take a look at what if we gave the LLM access to some tools that it could actually perform some actions on behalf of us. So essentially we're adding one more box to our, our diagram here. We're adding some tools for our CPU, or programs for our CPU to run. So what we wanna do here is define a set of tools or functions that the LLM can use as it's helping the user. The idea is not to just like give full read write access to our database and just say, go at it. That's probably not a great idea. You can try it if you want, but <laughs> I would suggest against it. Uh, the way this looks in Langchain is fairly straightforward. So if you have uh, methods annotated with a tool annotation, those will become available uh, to, the, uh, to the agent as tools that it can use. So in this case, we're defining some math calculator uh, functions. So one for determining the length of a string, one for adding two numbers, and one for calculating square roots. And once we have a tool defined like this, what we can do is in our, in our builder, just pass in a tools argument with as many classes that contain tools as we want. And when we then make a query, like what's the square root of the sum of the numbers, of the letters in hello and world, you will see that it essentially calls these different tools first to get the actual uh, answers. And then finally it answers uh, our question. So this can be super helpful as you're getting more into it. And we're gonna take a look here at the end of the talk with an actual real life example of what this uh, looks like. Spring AI does not have a concept of tools yet, so we can't look at that. And semantic kernel, essentially we already took a look because everything there is a tool. Everything is a plugin that we defined. So for instance, here we had the search plugin was a tool, but this uh, tool could be anything else like Let's see here, if we go to the last prompt here. Mm. Let's see here. A simple chat. No, this is the wrong one. Okay, I'm not gonna spend our limited time trying to find it here, but the idea is essentially exactly what we had here. So as you're building the kernel, you can add as many plugins as, as you want. A plugin can also just be an annotated method. It doesn't always need to be a file. So you have this whole idea of the kernel and you register different plugins for it that it can use as it's, as it's answering. All right. And that gets us to the utter end of the spectrum, which is fully autonomous AIs. This is something that Bill Gates wrote a really interesting uh, 
blog post about a couple months ago. So if you're interested in seeing his views on it, you can check this out on, on his blog. But essentially what he's arguing is that the whole landscape of app development and software development will change drastically in the coming years because we don't necessarily need specific apps for specific things when we have fully autonomous agents that we can just say like, hey, make a, like, make a dinner reservation for me on Wednesday evening and it knows what I what kind of food I like, what restaurants I like, it knows my schedule, it knows everything. So it can just like figure out a good restaurant for me and just make it happen. And of course any anything else like this. So this is like the other end of the spectrum. This is something that none of the Java libraries do yet for, for good or worse. Uh, semantic kernel is definitely uh, kind of furthest along of these. So they have the idea of planners that you can register. So before it even starts using any tools, it asks a planner, like, how would I go about solving this problem of kind of booking a dinner? And it was like, well, first we need to figure out what kind of food markets likes, like, uh, what does the schedule look like and this and that. And given this, it might call different tools to figure out all these things. Then it goes to an LLM that figures out like, well, how do we actually go about doing this. So it can auto autonomously take care of a lot of tasks for us. Um, the Python version of Langchain does have planners, so it's probably just a kind of matter of time before they also make their way into the Java library, but they are not there yet. So still have about 10 minutes remaining, and I want to spend most of that on showing you a demo of a real life application that I built. So this was inspired by um, one of the Langchain demos. The video here is not working, it doesn't matter. We have the actual application up and running here. So the idea is that we have a reservation system for Funair. I'm from Finland, our national airline is Finnair. So this is a more fun version of that. And here on the right side, we have essentially a live view of our database so that we can see as we're chatting with the chatbot, like how is it uh, updating our database based on that. I'm not going to look at the entire implementation of this application, but we're just going to take a look at some of these different levels of autonomy in practice. So this is using Langchain for now because uh, Spring AI and Langchain or Semantic Kernel don't have all the functionality required to create this application today. Once they do, I will update this demo with branches for all of them so you can play around. But what I have right now is a builder that produces a customer support agent. The agent has a system message defined. So this is like, how should it behave? Should it be helpful and uh, cheery. It should provide information. It always needs to get the following information, booking number, customer, first and last name. And before changing a book in, needs to make sure that those are permitted by the terms. And if there are charges, it should ask the user if those are okay. Good, so we have that. And I've commented out kind of these higher levels of autonomy for now so we can try it out. So let's see here. I'm gonna try to use dictation because typing is really difficult when you're doing a presentation. Hi, my name is Marcus. Okay, so let's see. Hello, Marcus. Yes, great. What's my name again? I forgot. Let's see. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> All right, so it's, it's trying to be helpful. Like, oh, maybe if you remember your booking number, we could try to figure out your name. <laughs> but clearly, it's not super helpful. Like, we just literally told us our name. So it would be super helpful if it actually did remember our name. All right, so let's, let's do that. So I'm going to add a chat memory provider here. So in this case, I'm using a, a version of that that takes in a ID and provides a memory provider. So this means that as we have different people in our system, each person has their, or each chat has their own memory. We're not just putting everyone's chats into one bucket because that would be very confusing. In this case, I'm saying like, just keep track of a thousand tokens worth of chat history and, and, and that should pretty much take care of it. So I'm gonna save this. That should hopefully rebuild the application. And this application is built using a framework called Hilla from one. It's open source. So if you want to play around with it, you can, all of this in this application is open source. Hi, my name is Marcus. 
Okay, so we'll try that. Hello. What's my name again? I forgot. Hey, so much more useful now. It, it knows who I am, but there's kind of a problem here. So let's see here. Let's, let's try to ask it something much more kind of meaningful in this context, like, hey, what's the cancellation policy? All right, so let's see. Hello, wonderful, yes. <laughs> I could probably tell it to be a little bit more <laughs> short here. Okay, so then it's giving us all kinds of stuff. All right, so you can get a full refund, 24 hours, non-refundable, this and that. So it's, it's trying to be very helpful because we asked it to be helpful, but the problem is that these things that it just said are not in any way related to what we have in our actual terms of service. So this would be really unhelpful to an actual customer being said like, hey, this is uh, the terms. And then when you actually try to do something, it's not at all happening. So this is where we add a content retriever. The retriever, again, remember, has both the store, the vector store that we have. It has a embedding model, so it knows how to take the question and turn that into a vector so it can search it. And in our case, we're getting two results with a min score of 0 0.6. So let's see if that helps us at all here. Hey, can you explain the cancellation policy to me, please? All right, so let's see. Okay, so now we're actually getting information that is specific to this uh, terms of service. So it's giving us the correct times and actually telling us what the charges are for canceling and, and so on. So this is super helpful to us now. Now the problem is, again, like we would now like to make some changes to our uh, policy or to our trip, but that's not something that we can do. So if I'm like, Hi, my name is Robert Taylor. My booking number is 105. I would like to go to San Francisco instead. Let's see what happens. So it's confirming stuff because we told in the system prompt it should ask. The problem is that when we actually get to the doing part, it's not going to be able to do any of that. So what I am going to do here as a last thing is I'm going to enable tools. And remember, this tools are essentially in any method that is annotated with a tool. So in this case, I didn't even pass in a text describing what this is because I used very descriptive uh, method names and, and uh, parameter names. If they weren't as descriptive, we would have to kind of explain them. But now we have ways of getting booking details, changing bookings, and canceling bookings. Hopefully, if everything went well. All right, so this is going to be our last thing, and then we have two minutes, which means I'll wrap up, and any questions will <laughs> unfortunately be, have to be outside. All right, so let's see what happens. Hi, my name is Robert Taylor. My booking number is 105. I would like to go to Stockholm instead. All right, so we should be seeing some change here, hopefully, if everything is going well. All right, Wi-Fi is a little bit slow, but we can see that. All right, all right, okay. Okay, same date. Let's see if this works. Okay, changes successfully made, Robert. And there we go. So that was updated in the database. <laughs> On second thought, I don't want to go to Stockholm. Please cancel my trip. All right, let's see if this works. Okay, successfully canceled. And there we go. All right, so by giving it some access to a limited amount of tools, we were able to make it do something that's much more specific to our business. And we could kind of, we didn't 
tell like here's our database and figure out how it works we told it like you can do these three things and nothing more and those three methods have very specific rules checking that everything that it tries to do is actually allowed so if you don't have those in place it will sometimes try to do stuff that it's not allowed to do and and you don't want that to happen all right so if you're interested in playing around with this you can come to our booth or you can check this out on your own it's on github it's all open source you can play around with it as much as you want I will try to update it with uh, semantic kernel and Spring AI examples as soon as they start adding the needed APIs. Okay, still see a couple of cameras. I'll do one final kind of wrap up slide here and then. All right, so to just summarize all the things that we just saw here, uh, I tried to kind of put everything into, into one slide. So in terms of functionality, uh, these uh, libraries seem to be pretty much like their capabilities are in line with when they got started. So Langchain for J, I think, is probably the most kind of or the earliest uh, mover in the Java space, and it pretty much supports all the things that we just tried to do. So prompt templating, output formatting, doing retrieval augmented generation, managing the message history tools. Uh, their documentation is very much in progress. I didn't find it last week, but the maintainer, fortunately, was kind enough to reach out to me on Twitter and point me to a place where they're building it right now. So uh, that should be there quite soon. Spring AI has surprisingly good documentation for kind of what they have there today. So they're kind of building it out and, and documenting at the same time. Semantic Kernel has, in theory, a lot of functionality but in practice, it's not available to any of us yet unless we actually take down the entire re repo and build it locally on our computer. So it shows a lot of promise. And I think in a month or two, it'll probably be a really nice library for us to use. With that, I want to thank you all for coming. And we might still have a little bit of time for questions. No? OK, let's, let's skip the Q&A. You can come up here and, and talk to me or outside in the hallway. I'll be here all day in uh, J Focus. So thank you all for coming. It was nice seeing you here. Bye.